Now to discuss this uh, next session, I would like to welcome on stage uh, the Esteban Contreras from uh, Sprinkler and uh, Guilhem uh, for you too, please, from uh, LinkedIn. No, sorry, LinkFluence. Oh, yes. Thank you. Ah, the emotion. Thank you, guys. Thank you. We, we see a long-term view of, of social media management. We are not focused on the short term. We're, we're looking at where brands and consumers yeah. will communicate 20 years from now. OK. You think it, may, it helps to be faster and more innovative than competitors? Um, I, I think we, we've always focused on our clients. So mm -hmm. we, yeah. we have vision. very focused on being as close as possible to the world's smartest and most creative brands to understand their needs. So instead of looking at the, the trends, you know, and, and social media trends have come from things like uh, Twitter dashboards to Facebook apps, we are paying attention to what the brands are needing so that, uh, so that we go uh, alongside them. So mm -hmm. we're not really focused on how quickly we go or where our competitors are going or even when, where the, the space is going. We're very focused on what our clients need and what they, need yesterday, what, what they needed yesterday, what they're going to need tomorrow, five years from now. So that's exactly the topic of that panel, is listen, attract, and engage. So we see this as part of all the digi digitization process of brands. Yeah, I mean, the, the way that we think about it is that the, the internet has transformed the front office. So in the last 20 years, customer care, HR, IR, PR, uh, marketing, all these groups have radically been transformed. Mm -hmm. And for those people that have lived through those 20 years, they, they can see the difference. But you know, if, if you're going month to month, you, you see it as a gradual change. But really, the whole front office has been transformed. Yeah. Um, the back office was transformed earlier. So you know, 70s, 80s, 90s, we saw the rise of really big companies that were thinking about finance, that were thinking about uh, resource planning. Uh, we're thinking about a lot of the back office stuff. We're thinking about what, what the front office has to do to be able to respond to this dramatic change of the web transforming how consumers think about how they have conversations with, with, with companies, but not just conversations, any form of interaction when you go into a store, when you go into a website, when you get an email, when you open a mobile site. Um, and so we really think about this idea of experience management. Yeah. And, and that's what we're really, really focused on and, and passionate about. Because um, if you can't manage those experiences, or, or let's say guide those experiences, um, then you will, you will likely fail your, your customer and, and, and consumers that may not even be your customers. This experience, this experience management is, is, really impo is really important. But also what we realized and what brands realized is that social web is not only about real time. It's also an archive of everything that happened uh, in the past. I can add up to that. I, I, I completely agree that um, it, it's interesting. Research used to be something that every quarter you would get a listening report or a monitoring report, and it would have a word cloud. And somebody would say, Here, here's the report, and that would be it. Yeah. Um, we're moving to a world where it's, it's, it's happening every second. Um, but you're right, it's not just about real-time marketing, which kind of became a trend in the past couple of years. It really is about context and yeah. understanding the consumer, right? So we're t when, when people think about context, they're usually thinking about Internet of Things or sensors. Uh, but in reality, context is, is the data that powers any interaction in a, in a physical or a space when it interacts with the digital space. Can you give um, us an example? So I'll give you an example. Um, for example, when a, when a brand, and I won't talk about any specific brand, but a video game console, right? Yeah. They announce a product. And so they announce the product, and within weeks, this product is going to ship. Um, immediately, as soon as this product is announced, they can uh, listen to their consumers, and they can interact with them, and they can gauge what are the things that people really, really liked and didn't like. Mm -hmm. uh, in the past, they didn't do this. You would announce a product, the product would be finished, and you would ship it. Yeah. Now, within a, a few weeks, uh, that video game console was able to say, um, all right, we have a big flaw here. Let's correct that flaw, add it to the software, um, and by the time that the product launched, 
what everybody wanted was included in the mm -hmm. product. And so that's, that's kind of what you're saying, that you know, it's not just about the real time, but it's understanding uh, that, that this is more about having the right infrastructure to make changes to your product, making changes to your marketing, making changes to your PR, whatever it may be that you're focused on. And ideally, all these groups start to integrate so that they collaborate and they can uh, not have a report that said, people didn't like this <laughs> six months ago. Too bad. You can say, let's, let's act on this no. right away. And execute. Mm -hmm. Bring one question from the audience. So make sure to ask uh, the questions in the interact section of the mobile app. And that's exactly what we're talking about here. So maybe you want to take it to talk about more about the opportunities. The question is, what is the biggest challenge in listening in a global environment? The biggest one, biggest challenge. The biggest ch challenge to listening in a global environment. Um, we really think that, that silos are the biggest challenge. So usually the way that traditionally listening yeah. has been done is that you have a, someone in consumer, uh, consumer research doing listening here one, with one tool, and then another team in the same market in marketing maybe having with a different tool and a different approach, different metrics, and then you have a PR team <laughs> doing the same thing. And then if, if, if you did an audit, and we do audits all the time, yeah. if you looked at an audit, you find that you have 100 people doing the same thing, yeah. And they're not connected at all. Yeah, yeah. So, so it, it, it's it's uh, it's a challenge that can be fixed when you have an infrastructure and an approach. So I would say you know you need a, the right strategy, the right infrastructure, and that includes the right technology and the right people that know how to collaborate. And and sometimes it's a cultural thing, sometimes it's a technological thing, sometimes it's just a, a lack of strategy. But if you can remove those silos, it, you start to understand what you need to understand and, and ideally you start to act on it, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you don't act on it, then it doesn't matter. What about you? I Biggest think of challenge. course what, what Esteban said is, is really important and uh, we experience that uh, also, so I won't add uh, anything. But uh, there is another challenge uh, and it's maybe a much a more technical one, but that is really, really, really critical for our market today. It's as linguistic capabilities. We're global, so we have to look at every language. We have uh, about 20 social networks. We look at millions of sources. So it, it, we have to be global. And we, we're constantly adding channels, constantly adding new sources that come in. And, and I agree, there is the language challenge. There is also the sentiment challenge is another challenge, I would say. Because, for example, if you, if you look at politics, you have uh, sometimes two parties going against each other. Mm -hmm. And then the sentiment will say, well, 70% positive. Um, but you have to look at the fact that sometimes there's just two parties and they're fighting against each other. So there's also that, that issue of, um, of one metric giving you the wrong information. Um, I think that, that that is another another big challenge in there. I have an interesting question coming from the audience again. I don't know what it is, actually. I mean, I know part of it. What about this dark social web? How do you listen to it? Yeah, that's, there's been a few reports about the dark social web and, and, and they What's end up- What's that, first they, of all, what is it? Uh, dark social web is anything that you, you don't really know where it's coming from. So there's, there's two camps. One says that it's the, the secrets and the white whispers and all these anonymous apps. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's others that okay. say that the dark web is just uh, something you can't track. Okay. Uh, what's interesting is that People are finding that a lot of what they thought was dark web is actually coming from Facebook, and maybe it's coming from the Facebook mobile app or the Facebook mobile on the browser. So um, I think that there, there will always be a challenge of certain places that are private and that you can't monitor, right? Um, and that's just something that, that you have to deal with. Um, but the fact is that the web is the best uh, focus group out there. There's unsolicited, unstructured feedback about a brand and there's more than enough dark web or no dark web <laughs> for you to listen to and to analyze and to think about and and i think that brands have a responsibility to do something uh, to have empathy to the people that are saying things about them and if for some reason somebody doesn't want them to hear something uh, because it's on a dark website or something then that should stay there private and, and brands should just respect that yeah and uh, we were talking before about um no, maybe you have a take on the dark social web. You want to react on uh, that? I mean, you start to focus on the white social web. Yeah, you start on that. <laughs> and uh, and okay. I can assure you that today, uh, maybe there's only 10% or 15% of the real value 
in this data that mm -hmm. is uh, uh, that is managed and uh, that is uh, really exploited by by, okay. by by brands. So we just have to move further and uh, and focus on that. And because at the end there is also a lot of question about um, privacy. Yeah. And I think it's a real really important uh, mm -hmm. point of our market. Because uh, on one side, you have private networks that start to sell the data uh, that you put inside, and you're supposed to, you, you, you think that you are on a private network. And we focus, uh, yeah. Sprinkler or us, we, we, we only focus on the public data. And it's data people want to put in, at, at the visibility of everyone, you know. So I think it's also a contract between the customers, the brands, and us just to be an intermediary and find the right data for the brands, and this data has to be public. Yeah, if I could just give a, a quote, I think it was Mark Zuckerberg that said, um, it's not about uh, what we want to know about people mm -hmm. it's, uh, or what they are saying, it's really about what people want to, to be heard and, and what, mm -hmm. what they want to be known about them, yeah, yeah. right? So I think there is a line that, that you shouldn't cross. And, and, and it should never be crossed. And there's privacy concerns, there's security concerns, I think, that, that brands need to make sure that they have a point of view on that. Yeah, th this connects again with what we were talking about, what's next for marketers, what is happening like in 2015. We we're talking about the fact that visual content was more and more you know, visible. I guess the challenge for those uh, security or I mean, privacy issues that maybe with text was kind of different, you could just you know, filter or automatically, stuff like that. What, what is your... What is coming? What are the next challenges for? The, definitely for, for 2015, it will be, from our point of view, visual web. Experience management. Yeah, I mean, from our perspective, it's experience management. But I think for, for marketers in general, they also need to be thinking about uh, how do you create really good creative content mm -hmm. and how do you distribute it, right? So social networks are becoming distribution platforms. They are becoming uh, meta platforms where they have multiple apps. Um, they're really being transformed in what they used to be and how they're, they're growing to be a very meaningful part of, of people's lives and how marketers look at it. So we think about integrating owned, earned, and paid so that you can do personalization that is not annoying or creepy, but personalization that's actually utilitarian and that allows you to do storytelling that you actually care about. So I think that marketing is, is it was more of an art and, and, and now it's an art plus science and, and if, if those two sides don't come together correctly, then it can be dangerous because if you don't understand science part, then yeah. you won't understand how to do things like programmatic ad buying and, and native ads, and, and you will fail to understand that side of the equation. At the same time, if you just do, if you just think of everything like a robot and like automation, then you forget about the fact that you still want to appeal to people and, and to their emotions mm -hmm. and to um, the creative side of, of a certain brand. Um, so I still think it's really cool to see brands creating amazing content and it's cheaper than ever to produce almost like a mini film and put it out and give it to the people that actually care about that content. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, gentlemen. It was great to have you. Thank you. And Thank you. You'll be around no, if you want Thank to you. have more questions with you. Thank you. Thank you, guy. Thank you very much.